Let's go. Our guest today is a mathematical statistician dedicated to helping the public understand risk and make better decisions under conditions of uncertainty. He holds a PhD in mathematical statistics from the University of London, was a president of the Royal Statistical Society from 2017 to 2018, and since 2016 has served as the chair of the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication at Cambridge University. He's a fantastic scientific communicator who has been featured numerous times on Radio 4 and in many documentaries, such as Morgan Freeman's Through the Wormhole and The Joy of Stats. In addition to hosting a podcast called Risky Talk, he's written articles with entertaining titles such as How Dangerous is Burnt Toast, Choose the Yum and Rise the Yuck, and A Nine-Point Guide to Spotting a Dodgy Statistic. However, you may recognize him as the author of several books on the topic of statistics, including The Art of Statistics and his latest book, COVID by the Numbers. So please help me in welcoming our guest today, a knight in shiny Bayesian armor, Professor Risk himself, Sir David Spiegelhalter. Professor, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today. I appreciate having you here. Oh, it's great. Thank you. Well, wonderful introduction. I did do this other article, which was very successful on the BBC website. Will I live longer than my cat? And uh, that that you know, attracted a lot of views. It's still there. Yeah. yeah, I'll definitely have to link to that one in the uh, show yeah. notes for sure. Will I live longer than my cat? That is not a very interesting yeah. title. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you've definitely written some really interesting articles on statistics, a number of amazing books on statistics this is definitely one of my favorite books on statistics right here but talk to us about how you first got interested in statistics and what was it that drew you to this field oh yeah well i started off doing maths and i did maths at school it was, it was what i was quite good at so i did maths at university i went to oxford and uh, and i it's really very pure maths and i i liked the pure maths but to be honest, by about halfway through the second year, it got too difficult. I, you know, it just the level of abstraction was so high. And, um, and I was getting a bit discouraged. But fortunately, I had a, an inspiring, like so many people, I can go back to an inspiring teacher. And he was a young man. He's now Professor Sir Adrian Smith, president of the Royal Society, top scientist in the country, essentially one of them. And, um, and he was then 25 or something like that. And he was our tutor in, in to teach us maths. And he was he was not only interested in statistics, he was interested in Bayesian statistics. And so he was translating De Finetti's book on the theory of probability. So we used to sit in the pub and have long discussions about what is probability, what does it mean? You know, and those I, those those arguments over beer have um, you know have um, you know stayed with me and inspired me and kept me going. And, and I can just as I'll have an argument about what is probability unchanged from 50 years ago and I'll just launch in and we'll start arguing about does it exist or not you know the Bayesian versus the frequentist paradigm and I just let just wind me up and off I'll go just like 50 years ago and this is uh, one of the main reasons that I'm super excited to have you on the show because you know I want to ask you some questions about this about what it is oh, yeah. what probability is in Bayesian yeah. statistics and stuff. A couple of weeks ago, maybe about a month ago already, I had a, a friend of yours, uh, Professor uh, Marcus Dusotoy, on the show, and he's the one right. that introduced us and and uh, put us in touch. So, uh, Professor Dusotoy, thank you very much for that. Um, never in my life would I have thought that uh, a kid destined for failure such as myself would be sitting here talking about probability and mathematics, which uh, is esteemed professors like yourself. Um, but let's let's get into this. Uh, first thing I want to ask you is, is why is it that it seems like mathematicians tend to dislike teaching statistics? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, because statistics is not part of mathematics. And there's, you know, there's mathematical statistics, which I used to teach in Cambridge to the math students. And the only way to make it acceptable, I think, to the math students was to make it very mathematical. And it's all in terms of, you know, proving theorems and, you know, proving rules and laws and things like that. So there is this part of statistics that essentially is very mathematical. And that's what I learned. And that's what I taught. But that's not statistics. That's not what I do. I've been a professional statistician for 45 years or so. And uh, I've done some maths and it's been incredibly valuable to know some maths, but that's not what I do. And I think I'm, you know, you know, proper statistician. It's not 
a part of mathematics. The crucial difference is that in statistics, there are not yes, no, black, white answers. That's the big difference. I've just finally decided that's what makes it not part of mathematics, that there's always judgment involved. Um, in my Art of Statistics book, you know, I got a lovely quote from, um, uh, from uh, Signal and the Noise, Nate Silver's book, great book. And, he's, and he really hammers this on. He says, you know, the numbers do not speak for themselves. We speak for them. We imbue them with meaning. So that's what I really loved about statistics is that it is it uses math. It's a mathematical science, I suppose, but it, it is to do with interactions with the real world and people. It is embedded in real problems that people face. Um, and so uh, that's why I love it. But it's not part of maths. And no wonder mathematicians find it they don't want to teach. I don't blame them at all. It's very unsatisfying, partly because you don't even know what is probability anyway. You know, you don't even know what these things mean. And so uh, it's a deeply contested subject. That's what makes it such fun. I love, why I love it. And um, it's, it's, yeah, I'm not at all surprised that mathematicians don't want to teach it. And that's why, you know, I, they shouldn't teach it in universities. Mathematicians should not teach statistics in universities. And uh, the real problem happens in schools, because in schools you've got math teachers, and some of them quite like teaching the stats, a lot don't like teaching the stats, because there's no yes, no black, white answer. Um, and so that's a real problem, because there is not a dedicated training, you know, group of people who are trained to teach statistics and data science in schools. And I think that is a real, real problem. We might get to this, you know, for the future of education in the world. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was uh, interviewed Professor Andrew Gelman maybe a year or so. I can't remember okay. how long it's been yeah. now. Yeah, he, he's awesome. And he made this uh, statement that I just, it really stuck with me. He said, statistics is the least important part of data science. And I just found that to be such an interesting, yeah. uh, interesting idea. Um, but it's just, it's, it's just part of it. It's just part of it. So I've been really yeah. inspired by it. I've been really inspired by Andrew as well. I find him, uh, you know, yeah, learns a lot. Very from. interesting. Yeah, definitely very interesting, uh, interesting professor. I enjoy speaking with him. Uh, but as you mentioned in your book, um, uh, rigorous definitions are important in statistics. So I guess, what is statistical science and what is it all about? Yeah, that's a good question. I kind of think of it as the art of learning from data. That, and that's what I call my, you know, the book. I sort of use those terms um, because uh, although it's a statistical science, I call it the art of statistics, my book, because there is elements of strong judgment in there. It's not, uh, you don't, it's not like some algorithm you apply to data and it gives up its answers. No, no, and that's what Nate Silver said. You know, it's, it's, it, it necessarily involves judgment and, uh, and that's what makes it so delightful. Um, but it is, it, but it, you know, it is based on data, on numerical information, on counting things, and then, um, and it involves the whole business of deciding what to count and, and going out there and getting it and cleaning it up and all that kind of stuff. But crucially, it then involves that step of deciding, well, what does it mean? You know, what can we learn from it? What can we conclude with all the uncertainties and uh, all the limitations? How does it, how does it answer our questions we actually started with? And that's what's so interesting about it and i think it it makes it into a, a beautiful valuable um fascinating and infuriating subject and as you talk about in your book the the art of statistics which i highly recommend everyone check out uh, definitely one of my favorite books on statistics uh and probably one of the only books on statistics that i've read that has given a clear framework for how to handle problems and, and approach problems in statistics uh and you, you call it the ppdac cycle uh Talk to us about that framework. Yeah, I mean, I think I, 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 someone from New Zealand told me they, they refer to it as PPDAC, I think. So um, that's um, it's stolen from New Zealand, but it, I, originally Wayne Olford, I think, developed that in, in Canada, in, in um, Waterloo University. Um, and the whole point is, I start the book, is about problem solving. So, you know, the P, you got PPDAC, you got, you know, it starts with P, the first P is a problem. It's something you actually want to know about the world. And it may be a prediction, maybe to understand causation, it may be just to know how many of something there are out there. So there's some problem that you want. And then the second P is the plan. You know, actually, can the data answer the problem? Maybe you just can't answer it. You know, be, then just give up, you know, just know that you have it. You just cannot answer this question. A bit like, you know, saying, okay, I want to know how effective face masks are. Well, 
there isn't any data out there that's suddenly going to tell you this. You know, you, this is unanswerable, essentially, from the data that's available. So, um, but then you want to go out and collect what you can, you know, and see what there is, um, uh, and maybe do an experiment or whatever. So then you, you have to plan it and think about it in advance. I think that's a really crucial thing. Statistics is not just responding to data. It's, it's, it's innovative and experimental and, and, um, uh, and, and imaginative. So then, then, you know, you get the data and that's, you know, just, oh, you just get the data. Well, of course, that's a massive issue. Collecting it and cleaning it and checking it and doing what missing data and all that stuff. So, but basically, it's turning it into a nice form. It's that wrangling bit, as it's the collection and wrangling to turn it into something you can do something with. And then you do the analysis. You know, that's the A. But even that's complicated because you've got exploratory analysis, just looking at the data, drawing graphs. That may be quite enough. And then you've got a confirmatory analysis where that's the one little bit. And this is what Andrew, I think, is referring to. Just, it, that's the one little tiny bit. <laughs> Where all this stuff that we learn in statistics about probability theory and sampling distribution, the sample mean and confidence intervals, blah, blah, blah. There's one little bit where that comes in. Then you get into the C, which is conclusions and communication. And that's unbelievably important you know, because it's working out, well, what can I actually say? And how am I going to say it? Um, and then the whole thing starts again. The crucial thing is then you just go straight. All that does always is generate another problem <laughs> another question and you start and round and round you go so um when they they really develop this in the new zealand education system and they really get kids to do this cycle very quickly the whole thing in an hour kind of thing you know just um just to really do it again and again and again very very brilliant train and um so i i this this just learning about this different way of teaching it um has revolutionized my my ideas about teaching stats and led to the book being having a very different structure in which probability doesn't come in till two thirds of the way through and so on. But there's lots of people now who've flipped around to do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that's something I want to touch on a little bit later is, is why is that probability? Like, I mean, I, I studied stats in, in, in grad school, a little bit in undergrad as well. And I took a ton of statistics before taking the first probability theory course. Uh, and at that point it was probably like, you know, third year undergraduate before I took like you know, first year probability course. Um, but, but yeah, I guess, why is it, why is that probably like, you know, we put these statistics cart in front of the probability. Well, I, I, yeah, no, I mean, the traditional way of teaching is the probability comes first. And when I was teaching it in Cambridge to the math students, yeah, they'd done all the probability because traditional statistics start straight away. You might do, you know, mean, median and mode and a few summary stuff. And then you get straight on to sampling distributions of individual data points. And then that leads to sampling distributions of statistics, sample means, central limit theorem, and all that stuff that, allow, that builds this structure for the mathematical results for constructing confidence intervals and so on. But you don't have to do it that way. That assumes probability you know, comes first. And in the book, I, I was amazed in writing the book. It took me ages to structure it. And it was a revelation to me that I could write nearly the whole book with only the idea of picking something at random, which a three-year-old child can understand, that you stick your hand in and pull something out at random. That's all you need for nearly all of statistics, <laughs> especially if you introduce you know, uncertainty through bootstrapping. So um, it, it, it's quite extraordinary how, you, how far you can get with those ideas before bringing in probability theory. Then it is useful to bring it together because then it means that you can do some stuff using mathematical results rather than simulation. And you can, um, and, and then if you start going to start doing p-values and hypothesis tests, you can do a lot of that without probability theory, but actually it makes it hugely easier if you've got some probability theory behind you. And of course, the Bayesian stuff yeah. absolutely needs probability because Bayesian statistics is just a branch of probability. So yeah, it's absolutely essential for that. Before we move into some of those philosophical uh, discussions, I want to ask a question. You, you mentioned in, in the book that statistics is kind of uh, to blame for the reproducibility and, and replication crises in, in science. It, why, why is that? How well, I wouldn't say statistics is the statistics is to blame for it. No, no, it's just that there is a you know there is a, a real problem, and um, and statistical you know in a way misuse of stats is is part of that. I think. And, and that's very recognised. That you know I know that you know I can get a set of data and I can prove almost anything from it if you give me long enough. You know, torture the data till it gives up. You know, the answer you want. And um, so you know th that's why 
the important of pre-specification of analyses and so on. Um, though, uh, you know, if you really want to do a confirmatory analysis, you should specify it beforehand, um, and 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 so on. So uh, I think that uh, it's a part of that. But there's lots of other aspects to do with lack of reproducibility and replication. I mean, just but you know, uh, the since so much of the claim, the claims in science are based on finally a statistical result, then it's the lack of reproducibility of those statistical results does become a very, very important aspect. Yeah. So speaking of of learning from from data, you know, going from essentially a sample out to the general population, uh, you talk about you know inductive versus deductive inference. Um, so I guess how can we use this process of inductive inference when we want to use data to learn about something? I guess yeah. I might have just leaked the answer there a little bit, but yeah. No, I, I don't, I, you know, there's supposed to be a problem with induction. I don't see much of a problem at all, um, provided you realize that everything you do when you're doing induction is assumption based. You know, there's no true way of doing it, there's no correct way of doing it. It's all based on assumptions because you're generalizing from a, a particular to a general, um, whether it's the future or whether it's a general population. And the only way to do that is make assumptions. Maybe the sun won't rise tomorrow. You have to make assumptions. And so once you've got the idea of a statistical model, uh, which is you know, a map of the world, it's not reality, all models are wrong. But once you've got that idea of a model, in other words, your assumptions about how the world works, then you can do induction. Um, but it's model dependent. You know, Whatever your understanding is, you, you can't make any conclusions if you've got some understanding about the pro underlying processes. Otherwise, you can't say anything. Because anything could happen. Everything, you know, so be like you'd be like a baby where everything is a total surprise. You know, everything just woo pops up. Like my dog, and actually, my dog is more intelligent than that. My dog realizes that one thing tends to follow another, and she gets very upset when I don't feed her at the right. If I, you know, if I picked up a bowl and didn't feed her, she'd be, uh, you know, staggered. She just couldn't. So the dog can do it. So, but that's because the dog has got a model, <laughs> little internal model of the world that you know I'm a, somehow a reliable person. You know probably not right but never mind but so I don't see a problem with it really um but it, as long as you realize that everything is dependent on assumptions and those assumptions will be wrong they're always inadequate every model is wrong but you can do go a long way with it but you have to have some humility about acknowledging the limitations of what you're doing so so I guess just to kind of press on the question a little bit more here so when we talk about uh, induction and inductive inference like should the should the philosopher in us get worried at all about the problem of induction in, in statistics not at all no, i don't think so no and i i mean i can i you know i read a little bit of hume and you can see the sort of you know complaints about the fact that there's no um you know there's almost paradox that you know there's no reason you know logical reason why this should be possible and i completely agree but that doesn't matter because you've got to do it and everyone does it and um so yeah, I mean, I guess that's why people don't like, you know, people don't like, mathematicians don't like statistics. You have to make this sort of leap of faith almost, because it's not like from axioms you can show something in deduction. I mean, in, um, the, the, the very problem in, in statistics is that you know the axioms are untrue, <laughs> you know, your assumptions are untrue. There's no such thing as a normal distribution. There's no such thing as independent observations. There's no, all these things we assume are untrue. We know they're not true. So everything we say is conditional on on assumptions that we know are untrue now the crucial thing is how much it matters and that's a matter of judgment and so i think um no wonder mathematicians don't like it it's a totally opposite subject it totally goes completely in the wrong direction so just the the, the statement there that we know the normal distribution it, it's untrue talk to us a little bit about that like the, the, i know that some of the audience members listening are, are going to be scratching their heads like what do you mean normal distribution well, for example yeah. you know the normal distribution it's got a domain from minus infinity to infinity. When we analyze people's heights, it's actually, they're pretty normally distributed in the population, but they don't go off to minus infinity. You know, now that may not matter. The fact that they're truncated at zero, I mean, it doesn't matter very much. And, uh, and they don't go off to plus infinity either. You don't get 50 foot high people, even, even in 10 billion, but you should do if it was really a normal distribution. So that, um, or maybe not 50. I don't know. You'd have to get you'd get staggering behind. So anyway, so um, but it's it's a it, in the area that matters. It's a really good assumption, and it doesn't matter that much anyway. So you know, we know all these things are untrue, um, but they 
but they work. So do you have any examples of, of, of when inductive inference has failed in statistics that you could share with us? Well, about a million of them, <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, the, the financial crash in 2008. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's a you know, classic example where people's models were wrong, and so they make all these judgments about what's going to happen. They're, completely, they're just completely deluded themselves because of the wrong models. So you know, there's, there's endless examples where people have just made the wrong assumption. They're making inductive inference about what will happen you know, in, in other situations, given the ones they've observed, and it didn't. Yeah, uh, the, that's something I've been kind of running into a lot of lately is uh, that talk about the 2008 financial crisis. I've been reading a lot of uh, Nassim Taleb and then uh, some, some Mandelbrot misbehavior markets. And it's just been changing kind of like, I feel like everything I, I, I knew about the law of large numbers, the central limit theorem was yeah, incomplete yeah. or wrong. Yeah, no, no, I think, and, um, you know, in fact, you know, as Taleb says, and others, you just have to assume you know, heavy tail, power tails. Um, and if their powers, you know, is wider than a Cauchy, there's no central limit theorem at all. You know, there's just no, things don't converge. You don't get this nice behavior. Things happen suddenly far bigger, you know, more extreme than anything you've ever observed before. But there's, you know, there's a statistical theory for all this. There's extreme value theory. There's all these things. It's not like this is magic. We know about, we actually had to deal with these situations. Um, it's not like this is some, oh, that means statistics, you know, is wrong or doesn't work. No, we know how to deal with these things. It's just that it hasn't been done very well. So getting into to probability here, uh, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, but just to, to really solidify the concept here, like, why, why do we need probability theory when we're doing statistics? Yeah, that's a good problem. As I said, I, I don't think we do until we get on quite advanced stuff. Uh, you don't. Um, Actually, you know, you could say you could do almost all of stats without probability theory if you use sort of simulation methods, what's called bootstrapping, and you simulate new data sets similar to the one you've already got, look at the variation in those data sets in your analyses, and it gives you an idea of what the uncertainty is about what you're doing. But if you can use probability theory, it makes it a hell of a lot easier because <laughs> you can do quite a lot in closed form or through approximations and so on. And um, it just really helps to you know, act as if the world works probabilistically, whether it does or not, whether it's all, it might all be, um, you know, preordained by some great intelligence. We might all be sitting on the backs of a pile of turtles, but it doesn't matter. We act, we act as if things work in a stochastic way. We act as if murders happen, you know, in a stoch according to some stochastic process. Well, they, you know, they don't really, do, but it's, it's as if they do. You know, it's amazing how well, that's why I show in the book, things like Poisson distributions fit the number of murders each, each, each day and things like that. So it is extraordinary how um, the world, um, through you know, having enormous complexity and vast numbers of possibilities of things happening, um, actually what does happen follow then starts following laws, you know, reasonable laws, as if they, it was a random process. So, you know, so I, you know, this is brilliant, it's wonderful. So we can use probability theory to do extraordinary things, prior we don't actually believe it, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, essentially what probability theory allows us to do is to take assumptions about how the world works, how the data is generated, and turn it and flip it around after we observe some data into you know, statements about our uncertainty about how the, about, you know, parameters or the, you know, features of the underlying features of the world. Well, like we can do that flip, which of course is very explicit in Bayesian work indeed, where, you know, after seeing some data, our uncertainty, you know, turns into uncertainty about the underlying quantities that are, gen that are doing the generating. Um, so we learn about the underlying processes and our uncertainty about those are, come from naturally, our assumptions about the uncertainty, the, the variability in the data. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a, so statistical inference is a way of turning variability into uncertainty, which I think I was told fifty years ago by some wise statisticians, and I thought, what on earth are they talking about? I have no idea what that is. So after fifty years, I finally come to that conclusion. <laughs> they were right. <laughs> Run that back one more time. That the quote that statistics turns variability into variability uncertainty. into uncertainty. Because variability, the probability distributions in the world, the normal distribution of the problem, is all to do with variability. It's all to do right. with just how things how things vary from time to time, place to place, and things. 
And by making assumptions about that and going through the statistical sort of um, you know, machine, we end up making statements about the, uh, our personal uncertainty about what, about these underlying mechanisms about the parameters, we could call it, the things with Greek letters, the things that actually produce this variable, that underlie this variability, the, the processes underneath. So, um, which is an extraordinary thing. So, because in the end, we want to use to say, we want, we want to learn from data. And that means, you know, taking the data and then afterwards coming up with some uncertain statements about how the world works. And, um, and we do that by, you know, uh, making assumptions about how the data was, how the data, the the, um, the mechanisms by which the data was presented. But we, what the clever thing is that we can do it by just le- making certain assumptions about how the data was generated. For example, normal distributions. But we don't make assumptions about you know the, the where that normal distribution is or something that we have to learn from the data. Hey, I mean that's a simplification because you know we can learn about the shape of the distribution from the data as well. And also within a Bayesian framework, we start off also with some judgments about where the center of that distribution. So, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule at all, but that's the general idea, I think. So before, before we get into the Bayesian stuff, let's kind of take, take a step back here. Uh, kind of may, maybe first principles, I don't know if that's the right word to use in this, but, but what what is probability? How do we measure it? I mean, it seems like such a strange oh, epistemological well, concept. Exactly, you tell me what it is. I haven't got a clue, but I, I do have a belief. I mean, the probability is, I, I consider it's a virtual quantity. It doesn't exist. I mean, you, you know, if you've got time and mass and, and length and all this sort of stuff, there's scales for it. We can temperature, we can measure it. You can't measure probability. There's no probability ometer. You can't measure it. It doesn't exist. At, it's not out there in the world at all. So um, uh, this is, I, I, I genuinely believe this, and I think it's the only way to, it's only, for me, it's the only way to think about it. So it's essentially constructed. It's a, it's a construction. So that's why I actually, I don't believe it objectively exists, except possibly at a subatomic level, because although there's, I mean, apparently still an argument about whether there are hidden causes behind, for example, you know, uh, you know an atom, you know, breaking up or whatever. And um, it's, it's you know, I think Hawking uses the term determined probabilities for the, the probability that the uranium atom will, will, you know, will, you know, will fall apart in the next, you know, hour, minute, second or something like that. So th- these are actual, un- the, the, the only unconditional probabilities. These the only ones I would consider are properties of the world. Everything else is conditional and probably any number we put on anything is conditional on assumptions and knowledge and they will vary from person to person and their constructions. These numbers do not exist out there in the world. And Dave Fanetti in his book, Theory of Probability, which Adrian Smith was translating when I first met him, you know, right on page one, he's got big bold letters, probability does not exist. So I learned that when I was 19, I suppose. Never shifted my opinion. No, absolutely. So that means I'm a Bayesian subjectivist. In that I don't, I believe probabilities are constructed by argument and discussion. They're not estimated; they're assessed, and they will vary from person to person and place to place. I mean, can we say there's a at least some type of difference between maybe epistemic probability and and some physical or uh, I believe you say uh, aleatory aleatory yeah yeah that can be useful but it's again you know like um, you know the way I usually do it is you know I've got a coin I'm trying to find a coin now and I you know I say okay what's the probability of this coin coming up heads can't find a coin and uh, we're going to imagine a coin here's a coin what's and that's an aleatory probability so you might think this is chance property of the coin may not be 50 50 exactly or doesn't it, it might depend on how I flip it, but let's say 50 50. So I flip it, put it over, like cover it up. What's the probability this is heads? And when I do this all the time with audiences and school kids, and they will go, oh, blah, 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 blah. and then eventually somebody, some brave soul might say 50 50. And I say, yeah, that's your probability. And then I look at the coin and say, it's not mine anymore. So well, what I've done there is flip from, you know, aleatory chance to epistemic uncertainty. Once the coin's flipped, it's covered up. There's no uncertainty. There's no chance left, no randomness. It's purely my lack of knowledge. But it hasn't changed. It's still 50-50 as long as I don't look at it. So I, I think it is re- that it can be a useful distinction, partly because it explains the Bayesian approach, because the Bayesians are just as happy with putting probabilities on epistemic uncertainty, what they happen not to know, as for future events. This is no distinction between those two at all. Whereas uh, within a classical 
framework for Quentus framework. Um, you're not allowed to put probabilities on, on events that have occurred. Um, you're, not, you're not allowed to do it. So it, it, would there be a difference, I guess, in, in the way that maybe a philosopher or a statistician would interpret probability? Yeah, I, I mean, I tend not to read philosophers writing about probability because I kind of think, oh, I can't be bothered. You know, I, I, so <laughs> I, 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 I argued about this in the pub 50 years ago. I made up my mind and that's it. So, <laughs> um, so I, I can't be bothered, you know, because there, is, there are some claims, oh, yeah, probabilities are somehow out there. There's some underlying propensity for something to happen in the world. Well, I don't. Okay. you know show me it you know i'm, I'm i suppose i'm a very much a pragmatist i, I follow um cs Purcell's and you know i believe you know, unless you can show me the thing i'm not going to i'm going to treat it as a virtual quantity and use it use it all the time but i'm not going to pretend it's there um so that that i and, and people will have different views so there are bayesian philosophers are probably there's all sorts of different views but the point is that nobody there's no consensus about this at all so there's no agreed uh, no wonder people don't like discussing this probably you know mathematicians or even philosophers because there's no agreed idea of what probability is can you believe it you know it's i i find it you know it's slightly like, it's like a dirty secret you know you've got to admit it to people that oh you do realize this entire world subject we built about probability and statistics is built on unbelievably shaky ground and the, the very yeah. basic ideas the mathematics is agreed but the very basic ideas of what it means, there's no agreement. I think that's part of what makes it really difficult and unintuitive to grasp and to think about and, yeah. and yeah. easy to make judgments. I mean, it, probability theory, if I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, kind of arose from uh, games, games of chance, yeah. right? That's, yeah. kind of, that, yeah. that, that, that's what birthday. And in those domains, you know, you're rolling a you know, six-sided die, two of them. What do you expect to see on average? Those types of domains, I feel like it's we can intuitively kind of grok that. With yeah, that they're means. fine. They're fine, but they're all wrong. I mean, they're all yeah. just they all make assumptions about the coins and things. So when I yeah, demonstrate yeah, kids, yeah. I carry two-headed coins with me and just say, "Look, oh, sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. didn't think of that, did you? So this probably isn't a half or whatever, and it's not going to converge to anything. No, I fiddled it. So it's all." based on assumptions about the, the, the model and the process and then you can draw some con mathematical conclusions but yeah. you know the coins don't come up exactly 50 50 and you know there's all sorts of ways uh, these things just don't as i said apart from possibly at the subatomic level they don't exist as 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 verifiable numbers and yeah, and, yeah. yeah. i i kind of use it uh, as a you know a way to make decisions it's kind of a weird way now i can't believe i'm going to be saying this out loud but I, I think about any action i'm going to take right if i'm going to take an action I'm, if i'm going to do something you know what would the result be of this action in let's say a thousand parallel universes right hmm. is it going to be yeah. a favorable outcome 20 percent of the time favorable yeah. outcome you know yeah. x percent of the time um but you ever only see one reality so yeah. it's like yeah it's kind of hard to explain i don't know if that makes sense that's great no i love that metaphor i use that you know um I can't remember what I call metaphorical probability or something. I really love that interpretation. It's the only one I really like, I think. Like, you know, if you are going to have a some sort of mechanistic, apart from just pure subjective belief, um, I, I like to think of that. So, well, you know, if I'm talking about a future, I think, well, there, there are all, as I said, there's a hundred possible ways things might turn out, for example. They're all equally likely, all these little paths going out into the future. In what proportion of those possible futures is the coin going to come up heads? I'm going to be alive in 10 years' time. The world will, will cease to exist in a century, et cetera, et cetera. All these parts, and some of them end in, uh, you know, catastrophe and others carry on okay. And I think that's a fantastic metaphor, um, you know, a multiverse-type metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, what, yes. the, yeah but the bizarre, the thing that I've been criticised for, you know, um, uh, others who do this, is that you end up using a frequency interpretation of what actually is a Bayesian subjective judgment. So if I think... So I, if my probability for, um, you know, the world ending by year 2100 is, you know, 0.1 or something, or is 1%, then my pure judgmental probability, what I mean, you know, one way of describing that is of a, out of 100 possible futures, it's going to happen in one, you know, and which is a frequency interpretation, you know, which is very valuable, fantastic. When we, when I, when 
with the stuff we design for patients to use when they're discussing cancer risks and everything, we never use the word probability, chance, or any, any of those things. It's always described in terms of out of 100 people like you, what would we expect to happen to them in the future? Um, we don't use out of 100 the ways things might turn out for you. Um, partly in those circumstances, I don't think it's, that's not the right metaphor because we know the numbers that we incorporate are not, what we use are not personalized. There's always factors about the individual that will be different. So it's when we talk about these risks, it's not your risk because we've only put a few things into a formula and into an algorithm. So the correct embedding of that to say out of a hundred people who tick the same boxes as you, we'd expect so many to be alive in 10 years, 60 to be alive in 10 years. And that's the appropriate metaphor, I think, for, to, for, you know, for communicating that probability, that judgment. Um, so I, I, I think this is really important. And I think people are not stupid and that a good metaphor like that we can really work with people and I much prefer, I don't use chances, I don't use coin analogies anymore for any of these things. Um, yeah. I used to all the time and now it's just stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Usually when I start talking about a hundred possible parallel universes, people start looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm glad. No, that you no, I love, it. I love it. Yeah, but yeah, but people do think you're crazy. So you, <laughs> some people really get it. Um, you know, 100 possible futures for you, way thing. And then for climate change, because there's only going to be one planet going, so you can't say out of 100 planets like this, really. You have to say out of 100 possible futures for this planet, this is what we'd expect to happen. And I don't think that's, especially if you, I've seen some lovely drawings where you see this sort of lovely, you know, here we are at the moment and we, there are all sorts of ways we could have got here. So you've got all these sort of tangled web of possible causal paths. And then from now on, there's this tangled web of possible ways in which things might turn out you know, with the uh, multiverses or whether they all happen simultaneously because it's another matter, but we don't have to go into that because we're only going to see one of them and we don't know which one it is. Um, so I think this idea of a sort of spaghetti of possible futures, one of which is going to happen, is a very powerful image. And of course you see it, that's what Monte Carlo analysis does explicitly, is draw spaghetti, you know, plots for the future. There's a, I saw this beautiful image that, that uh, most captured everything you talk about it was it was a uh, it, it was a hundred different paths leading up to one moment in time with the with the a barrier a line yep. and then it, it said all your possible futures like going for it so oh, it, to me it was said, like ah. have you seen that? i i i made one of those by getting a picture yeah. of an opt a, a squid and cutting it in half and putting it back so so there was the squid going up and the squid coming back yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really cool oh and glad some others are doing that yeah yeah, yeah if, I, if I find it i'll send you send you an email but yeah yeah, yeah. i'd love the, to, the, the, I'll have to steal that one yeah when i see that it's just like oh, okay well that means the future is a probability distribution obviously the past is determined it's it's determined it's but we might know yeah. not know which path was taken to get us here so that's, that's to do with yeah. causation we, we have to do with attribution mm -hmm. and things like that so, mm -hmm. you know, which is a, another whole problem particularly of course in criminology and uh, you know for, where the probability is all epistemic uncertainty because the uncertainty is about what happened and you're trying to judge the possible paths by which this particular event happened so in um, in crime everything is to do with the path that led to the current situation and the uncertainty so, about those yeah that's uh, yeah, I don't have any uh, intelligent response to that one. So let's get into Bayesian stuff. <laughs> uh, no, that's so why. Let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, that's why we're working on crime, you know, on, on um, edu education for lawyers and things that to do with it. And it's all Bayesian. Um, but we can't use that. We don't use that word. Um, that's right. You're not allowed to use uh, Bayesian approaches in the UK cool. courts, right? Yeah. So I, I guess talk to us about that. Like, what, what's the Bayesian approach all about, and why is it that uh, courts in, in in the UK are banning it or have banned it? Well, um, it, it, one of the points about the Bayesian approach is that it explicitly introduces judgment, and you know that is is far from being something to be embarrassed about. It's something to highlight the fact that there's um, it's a, a method of of learning meaning that it's not just what does the data tell us, it's, it's given what we thought originally, how does the data, what, how, what is it reasonable to believe after we observe the data? So you have to specify what you thought beforehand, this prior distribution, and um, which is enormously valuable thing, um, but it is introducing judgment. 
into the analysis and that's considered by many people you know and you've got to therefore be very clear about what you're introducing you've got to justify it you've got to do sensitivity analysis of different assumptions much better to have lots of people's opinions feeding through and so on so it's got to be done you have a huge responsibility in doing that but in the end I believe it's the right thing to do. In court, you're not allowed to do that because you can't put the prior distribution in. That's actually saying, oh, this, um, you know, uh, you know, just because, uh, you know, almost prejudice, I think, well, this person is more likely to have done it than anyone than somebody else. You, know, you, you can't say that. Yeah. So you're only allowed in the basin in, in the court is to put in what's called the likelihood ratio, which is the, in a way, the, the deductive aspect. It's the probability of the evidence given either guilt or innocence or some other hypo pair of hypotheses. So it's the likelihood, the central part of the Bayes theorem. So you're not allowed to do the whole Bayes theorem business. You can only do the data bit of it. Yeah. Mm. Then you are allowed to do that in court. So, so how is this different from the, the frequentist approach to, to viewing probability? What's the yeah. central difference? Yeah, I suppose the central difference is is just what is probability in the frequentist approach you assume probabilities are to do with long-run frequencies of repeated similar events how often if i keep on doing something how often something will happen so it's, that's that is what probability actually means um whereas the bayesian thing that's this you know you know is relevant but it's not that's not what probability means at all so you know according to a frequency thing you couldn't have a probability of a particular horse winning a particular race um, because that race is unthinkable to think of that race being repeated again and again and again in what proportion of times that might in that particular race you know that horse might win now as i said the in a way the paradox is that in explaining a judgmental probability it is actually quite useful to think of 100 races like that in what proportion to, so as a metaphor it's actually quite a good thing to think about it these hundred possible universes in which the race is won in what proportion does this horse win but it's not, not what the probability actually means is a that is purely a way of communicating a magnitude it's not what it means and that is the crucial difference within a frequentist framework that is actually the only way to define what a probability is and that's why when frequentists go through this business of turning assumptions about distributions into uncertainty statements they have to go do this convoluted confidence interval business instead of just saying well this interval is a 95 percent probability that the true i you know based on my assumptions there's a 95 percent probability that this interval contains the true value you have to say oh if i repeated this process you know millions of times in 95 percent of time this random interval would contain the unknown fixed quantity they oh, for goodness sake you know really you know, convoluted way of it's, it's, it's so not convoluted, it's so incomprehensible, and everyone gets it wrong. There again, I've yeah. taught, I've taught it for years, so I can move between the two quite happily. Um, and in fact, of course, I'd never use, and I, I would never use when I'm actually doing my communication work. I couldn't care less. I call them all uncertainty intervals, whether they're Bayesian, because in COVID at the moment, some of the stuff's confidence intervals based on classical analysis, but most of them are Bayesian intervals because. All the modeling is Bayesian pretty well in COVID. So they're credible intervals. These are Bayesian uncertainty intervals. And I don't use either word. I just call them uncertainty intervals. Yeah. Do Bayesians and frequentists fundamentally dislike each other? No, I don't think so. They used to be, yeah, I mean, they used to be real, you know, when I grew up as a statistician, there's huge ideological arguments, you know, every, because people were trying to fight to try to you know construct uh, in a way universal theory for statistics people have given that up now i mean that was a do doomed i think but, and i came in i learned at the sort of tail end of that attempt to have a, a, a great unified theory um and that's just gone out the window now it's, everything's much more pragmatic and ecumenical i move between them all very very you know very casually and um, it's just that you should understand what you're doing and you should be able to you know see what's going on and to understand the limitations of what you're doing. But there's no correct way of doing it. There's no correct theory of statistical inference. I don't think. Particularly so, as whatever you do, there, I mean, this is why I, I almost get cross with everybody because it's all dependent on the assumptions. Um, and the, the classic example I got is that in, in the UK, you know, there are eight different teams, great, really good building models to estimate, you know, this magic quantity R, RT, you know, the current number, average number of people that somebody will infect if they get COVID. And um, 
And they come up with their, they do all their analyses. They were all trying to estimate the same quantity using largely the same data. And they all come up with completely different answers. You know, their, their intervals don't even overlap. They're like, hang on, you can't all be right. If your intervals don't overlap, some of you must, at least some of you, if not all of you, must be wrong. So what that means is that the, the, because these intervals are dependent on assuming the model is true and the model is wrong. So that, that you know, you think, well, thank goodness there's eight teams doing it, not just one. Um, and uh, that really reveals to me, you know, makes me very, in a way, cautious, if not skeptical about a lot of statistical modeling, especially the intervals that come out of it, because they're all understatements of the real uncertainties. Whether they're Bayesian or classical, it doesn't matter. It, it seems like the prior distribution is something that makes Bayes' theorem so controversial. Why is that? Oh, yeah, no, I was just saying, and of course it does. And it's what makes it so powerful, but so controversial, because it is a mathematical expression of judgment. And, uh, it, you know, and there's no avoiding that. And it's something to wave a flag. Yeah, I, my judgment has gone into this analysis in some extent. It may just be a judgment about perhaps... Now, how smooth the curve, underlying curve might be. So maybe something, not saying where I think the curve is, but just how smooth it might be. So there might be just some imposition of a certain amount of smoothing in the model, just to make it estimable or something like that. Now, the point is that within the Bayesian framework, these things should be made very explicit and critiqued and justified. Whereas in, there's always, whereas in the classical framework, there's huge judgments being made about the structure of the model but they're just sort of swept under the carpet sometimes by just saying, oh, that's the model we're assuming. Well, hang on, why? It's wrong. This is a judgment you're making. And I'd much rather this was, a, this was a lot more explicit that you are bringing judgment into your analysis. And it's, you know, the pretense that somehow statistics happens as some automatic process that, oh, this is the correct way to do it, um, is, is, is nonsensical. It's always, always judgment. But it, it seems like Bayes' theorem is like the scientifically correct way to change your mind yep. when you get new evidence, right? So, yep. so what, why is that the case if, if judgment is, is like so controversial? But it's, but it's I mean? because it's, it's only internal Bayes' theorem only um, uh, assures internal consistency. Given your initial assumptions and some data, it tells you what you then should believe. But you might have been wrong in the first place. You know, everything might, you might be completely deluded. So it just, you know, assures internal consistency. And that's why, you know, that's something I believe very strongly is that, um, you know, that, you know, if any, anybody making any judgments, Bayesian or otherwise, <clears throat> probabilistic judgments should constantly be checking them against the real world. And there's whole idea of scoring rules, which are the mathematically appropriate ways to check how good your probability distributions are. If you keep on giving, you know, tiny probabilities to events that happen, then you sh you shouldn't be taken very seriously by anybody else, and you should you should question what you're what you're doing yourself. I mean th that's really shown so strongly in the work of super forecasters that use you know um, a particular scoring mechanism. They put prob they don't say what's going to happen. They only use probabilities, and um, and you find these super forecasters by their scores being better than other people's because their probabilities are more reliable. When they say something's seven, they give something a 70% chance, then out of those times, it happens roughly 70% of the time. But they also use, they, you can't get away with just doing that. Um, you also have to have probabilities that, that at least sometimes are, you know, are near 100 or naught because otherwise you're not being very helpful. So super forecasters can combine those two things. They can discriminate, but they can also have reliable probabilities. Um, and that's all based on judgment. I mean, there is some modeling perhaps, but mostly it's judgment. So I think that's a really good meta, you know, demonstration of these ideas that you, um, you want internal consistency, but you want also empirical validation with the real world. Yeah. I've been uh, reading a little bit of David Deutsch lately as well, and uh, he, he's having some qualms, I guess, with, with Bayesianism. He says that uh, Bayesian, you know, it, it, Bayesianism becomes controversial when you try to use it as a way to generate new ideas or judge one explanation against mm -hmm. another. Um, I, I guess, how do we reconcile that when we're faced with some epistemic? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get very suspicious of Bayesian approaches, to, for example, to um, giving probabilities on scientific theories or something like that. I, I don't. I really don't like that. 
I don't like that. I don't even like probabilities on models particularly because, again, De Finetti says that you should only give probabilities to things that are empirically, at least in theory, empirically verifiable. In other words, there is the possibility that they, you will find out whether one, which one is true. So in crime, yeah, someone either did it, did something, or they didn't. You know, it is a, there is some underlying fact there. But when you come to scientific theories, well, it depends what you think a scientific theory is. Is it really a fact about the world, or is it just a, a, an adequate explanation that's useful to assume for a while? So um, I, I am very cautious about using it in those circumstances of where it's used to put, to put probabilities on, on things that are not empirically verifiable. So I like to use it, I would like to think it's, it's being used on facts about the world, verifiable facts about the world, or that might be verifiable in the future. Not more, I don't like using it for more um, abstract ideas. How about using it to help us in our everyday lives to make better decisions? It, how can we use Bayes in, in that context? Oh. Well, we do it all the time. We've got Bayesian brains. We're doing it whether you like it or not. Our, brain, our brains are constantly, everything is Bayesian. And the brain is that, you know, it doesn't rely on data. It doesn't rely on what we're seeing in front of us. And, um, you know, the, what we're seeing in front of us merely serves to adjust what we expected to see in front of us. Uh, if we had to constantly just see everything anew, you know, we just couldn't cope with that, with that overload. So um, the brain is, you know, we are Bayesian. That's it. We, we update our expectations with what we see, and that allows us to navigate the world, just like a, like, just like a um, you know, self-driven car. Um, then that, they're all Bayesian completely. They've all got a model for how the world works. They see new, you know, bits of new data, and that revises what they believe. So, and they, all ha they have to work that way, but we work that way. So that's what we do. Now, we might not do it very well. We might have delusions. We might have you know, not see things well, we, we can be misled in all sorts of ways. But that's what we're trying to do. So I know we got just a, a few minutes left. I want to ask a couple of formal questions before we jump into just a real quick lightning round. Um, are you good to stay around for about five to six more minutes? Is that okay? Yeah, fine. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So uh, there's this quote that I absolutely love from the Professor Risk video. I'd love for you to, to, to elaborate on this. And it's one of the biggest risks is being too cautious. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's what I, I, I talk to school kids quite a lot. And I always say, yeah, take risks, take risks. Don't be reckless. Don't be stupid. You know, think of the consequences of what you're doing. But if you don't, if nobody takes any risks, oh, for God's sakes, what a dull old life we're going to have. You know, you, I mean, you won't get out of bed. That's pretty dangerous as well. So, you know, no, life is a risk. We don't know what's going to happen. Thank goodness. God, this may be awful if we knew what was going to happen. So, um, no, 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 there's, uh, we've got to take risks um, in all ways. And I'm not just thinking of physical risks. There's so many other risks we take in terms of, um, you know, friends and jobs and enthusiasms and, uh, you know, just, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm quite cautious in many ways, but also I do try to be as bold as possible. And because that's the only way you learn usually by failing, you know, but then you learn. So boldness, not recklessness. God, don't be reckless, don't be stupid. So I won't get on a motorbike, for example. You know, I, I, I'm pretty scared of that, but I will do most other things. Um, and so I, I got my own little, and we've all got it. You know, I don't regard it. I don't re respond to risks in a completely rational way at all. I mean, my emotions come into it massively I'm, I'm sure i'm not completely rational about lots of things i do but um i do genuinely feel that you just you know if you're going to experience you're going to learn you have to try new experiences yeah and that's when when i talk to school kids i say that but just don't be stupid you know don't do things you know that, that um could have really serious consequences unless you um uh yeah yeah just just don't be really, really careful about things that have got big downsides. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, you've got one life on this planet. Why not try to do something big, right? Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but, but make sure you've got some insurance, I think. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, protect <laughs> yourself against the big downside. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I used to be, uh, I used to be an actuary for a while. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Insurance is, uh, you know, just make yeah. sure you're not paying too much of the premium. Uh, so uh, yeah. last formal question before we jump into what I like to call the random round. Uh, it is 100 years in the future. What do you want to be remembered for? 
Oh goodness! Oh Christ! Um, oh, I didn't know. I, I don't. Nobody will remember remember me at all. Um, oh, I, I think. <laughs> um, oh, that's really good. Oh, I think. I think you know, as, as somebody who, um, in a way, uh, d- developed one of the developers. What am I called? You know, performing statistician that that put try to put statistics onto a public stage, um, and uh, realize that this involved. You know, an element of of acting, a performance of personality coming into it, and I think uh, I just thought of that. I'd never thought of that before, but I think that's you know, rather than you know, you know, actually, what I might do is you know, remember some of the the statistical stuff I do, which may seems to be surviving quite well in terms of citations. I'm still getting vast numbers of citations every year, so so the work might continue, but in fact, that's not what I care most about. I don't think. Let's jump into a, a random round here. First question is, what do you believe that other people think is crazy? Sorry, what do I believe? Oh, the other, oh yeah, oh God. Yes, I did see, looked at that. I thought, I don't know. Oh, I've got quite a lot of crazy things. Um, I've got crazy friends and I quite like crazy things. So, um, you know, Reiki, uh, I have treatments where people just put their hands on, don't even touch me, have their hands on me. Um, so I, I like that. Um, I uh, know what are other things do I do. But I, I'm I'm fascinated by by religious ritual, um, and I will take part in religious rituals. Um, I th- I think they're interesting, and I've got a lot of respect for them. And and really, you know, um, you know, real sh- strong, you know, proper <laughs> bonkers stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what do you uh, What are you most curious about right now? Oh, what am I curious about right now? Oh, I think. The thing that fascinates me is about misinformation. I think uh, is about you know how it, how it spreads, what we might do about it, um, particularly statistical misinformation. Because I I just I have a real fear. It's my big fear. I think um, with the breakdown of, of normal media and normal social a lot of social relations, just how easily people are influenced by influences and um, by by bonkers ideas. Now, I got my bonkers ideas, which I'm quite fond of, but um, there are some, but I don't think they're very dangerous. And there are a lot of really dangerous bonkers ideas out there. And uh, and they seem to be taking, you know, spreading. So I think that's what I'm curious about is what actually can be, you know, how can we try to, um, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, slow that down, yeah. Uh, what are you currently reading? Oh, well, I read terrible things. I mean, I'm, not, I'm reading a great book on luck. It hasn't come out yet by um, a oh. guy. In, so, and he's a gam. He's a you know a poker, serious poker player. So, nice book on luck because um, I'm fascinated by luck. I've made, done a, what I think is quite a good radio program on luck. Um, and I oh. learned so much from a philosopher, Angie Hobbs. She's a philosopher of luck. Oh, got it. There's like four different types of luck, and oh, it's brilliant. So I really yes. love uh, the four different types of luck. Is it from this book, Chase, Chance, and Creativity, where he talks about luck? Uh, you know, type one, type two, type three, type four. There's oh, I don't know. Maybe no, she had a different yeah. list. But the okay. one I really liked was the um, uh, constitutive luck, or which is just the luck in who you've been born as, which I think is just brilliant. I do like because it's one it's one over which one has absolutely no control whatsoever you know yeah. lucky think of it as something you haven't that outside your control but well, the biggest yeah. thing is outside your control is who you are and where you where in time and space and family you mm-hmm. have been born and yeah. well because i think i've been hugely blessed with that dot which dominates so much and i that's, think yeah. hell, that's it you know and and you certainly can't give yourself any credit for who you are so um I think yeah. that's that's fascinating. Yeah. That's, yeah, I definitely would want to uh, check that check that book out. Yeah, because I'm also fascinated by by luck as well. I mean, being a statistician, data scientist of sorts, somebody who loves probability theory. Uh, in this book, he talks about the the four types. There's uh, type one luck is dumb luck, blind luck, where you have no control over it. Yeah. Uh, type two luck is a luck that happens to you just because of your own actions and oh, your I see. activities yeah and you then, put yourself yeah i mean that's why you put yourself yeah. in situations where you allow it to happen no you yeah. make your own luck yeah really exactly yeah. yeah yeah and um and there was a winston uh, churchill uh quote we we make our fortunes and we call it fate or something like that yeah 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 uh, which is not completely true at all because it depends who i mean yeah. i think i think constitutive luck who you're born as dominates um, and just but, that 
who, who's the name of that the author that's writing that oh, book? Angie, that Angie Hobbs. Anyway, I, 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 the link yeah. there's a radio program. It's called Archive on Forum. Like I think it's, yeah. and I, I interviewed the poker player as well, whose book I'm reading. At the moment. So, so I'll I, definitely have to look into that. Yeah, I want to uh, want to definitely check that out. Um, let's let's go ahead and open up a random question generator. Get a few uh, questions in here. Oh yeah. Uh, here we go. <laughs> First question. I love it. Oh, I love the duck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, give me a that. question. What do you like most about your family? Oh, I love them. Um, well, I, 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 a couple of things. First of all, they put up with me, um, and that's the best thing of all. Um, but actually, um, I, I, the, the humor, I think, and the humanity, but the um, the humor is very important. Yeah. What was your best birthday? Oh, oh goodness, that's incredible. It's probably when I was six or I was sixty-five. Um, yeah, I think actually the one I, my sixty-fifth, I had a, a wonderful party in a friend's garden, um, and we had entertainers and uh, you know music, and it was it was just lovely. It was just lovely. Yeah. I quite like being old. I quite like being old. That's the point. I don't mind at all being old. Oh, goodness me. Well, that's yeah. such a good question. When was the last time you changed your opinion about something major? Oh, no, that's very difficult just to think of. Um, oh, COVID. COVID. Mm. Oh, God. Yeah, last March. Oh, I was I was under uh, March 2020. Oh, I thought, oh, poor. Oh, well, what's all the fuss about? Well, it wasn't quite that bad, but I really, um, I was deluded. I, I, you know, I should understand exponential growth, but I know I was... You know, thinking, oh, it'll, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. But I, I certainly wasn't um, keen on the people I thought were um, fear-mongering about how awful this was, must do something. No, they were right. No, I had to change my yeah. mind. So I yeah. was totally deluded. I'm glad nobody was listening to me. I mean, I, I didn't say anything in public, but yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for those listening, uh, Professor Spiegel Halter has another book that this most recent book is called COVID by the Numbers. So definitely check that out. I uh, haven't been able to check that one out yet. Um, but once it's released in Canada, I will definitely be, be checking that <laughs> one out. Um, so, uh, Professor Spiegel Halter, how can people connect with you and where can they find you online? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, on Twitter is, um, you know, uh, handle D underscore Spiegel. So I'm easy to find on Twitter. I got, since COVID, I got my followers have increased rather a lot and uh, you can easily find my email address my and my website just google the name there's not not that many active speaker holders uh, around yeah. it, is a, it is a stupid name so that's and those listening i highly recommend the book the artist statistics uh absolutely yeah, thanks love this for the book. plug thanks yeah for the plug. absolutely thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show today i really appreciate you being here it's a real pleasure, honestly. It's uh, it's not often you get a chance to so ramble on about your enthusiasms for an hour. So thank you very much indeed. That's it's my absolute pleasure. And my friends, remember you've got one life on this planet, so why not try to do something? Cheers, everyone. Be by be.